Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review, part 10, and this is session 74. When we left off at the break there, we were talking about that the sufferings are meant to work for us. We are talking about how do those sufferings, you know, what role do they play within our sanctification? And I, I left you when we were saying they're meant to work for us. In what way are they meant to work for us? We're talking about them being part of the process whereby we're conformed to the image of God's Son. These are supposed, these sufferings are meant to work in us to produce spiritual good. We've already defined, in your notes I said, in a minute we'll define that. We actually already have. That spiritual good is to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. But look, let, here's the other verse I was thinking about earlier. I knew we would get to it. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. What this verse, we've talked about this verse plenty of times. What this verse is talking about is that all things, and we're talking about those particular things that are happening to us, those situations and circumstances, are going to work together for our good. In what way? In that they play a part in conforming us to the image of God's Son. But is that automatic? Just because you suffer, does that mean that automatically gets done? No. What do you have to do? What has to happen? Huh? Thanks. you got to respond correctly to those sufferings. And part of that response is looking at those sufferings in a very particular way. And what is one of the ways that you can look at them? Okay, they're short term. Okay. What, what else? That's right, they're short term. But what else? <laughs> okay, okay y'all are stuck on the short thing. All right. So, so what? okay, they're not worthy to be compared to the glory. Do one more. All sufferings are an opportunity. There you go. There you go. They're all an opportunity. They are all working together for my good. That changes your perspective about it. That is not something you will automatically be thinking. I promise you. When something bad happens, you won't be going, man, this is going to work for my good. You have to do that on purpose and think about what God is doing in this dispensation of grace and how that impacts how we view sufferings. Everybody with me there? Okay. So, well, it is all things, but um, we normally quote that verse when, um, when bad things are happening. When good things are happening, we don't, we, we couldn't care less about that verse, but, uh, but it is. All things are working together for good. And by the way, they ought to, shouldn't they? They should. Okay. So, uh, here's the next one. Sufferings are an opportunity for the glory. Someone's already mentioned that, so let me just put the verse up. For the glory which shall be revealed in us. And now, to quote that verse that we were just looking at. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. There's that being conformed to Christ's image. Folks, that's the goal of our sonship life. That's where all of this is headed. That's what your sanctification is about. That's what the doctrine is designed to produce. And sufferings are the crucible in which that gets done. It's a, th those are mu and that's why there's so much in there about, about the sufferings. We know that, look, being, being conformed to the image of God's Son, when the Spirit is dwelling in you, that's what He's doing. Now let me ask you a question. Is being conformed to the image of God's Son, is that like a light switch? It's either, either click you are or click you're not. No, it's not like that. It is a process that happens in areas of our life as we progress through the doctrine. So is it possible to have one part that's working pretty good, but yet you've got another part you still have to work on? The answer is yes. 
And I just want to say that. I don't want anybody to get discouraged with the fact that you may see some part of your life that you know still needs to work on. You just want to think, well, I'm not being conformed. That's not, that's not actually the case. Um, the Spirit, when He dwells in us, that's what He's working toward. And that, somebody mentioned this in the last question, that, I think it was Eric, that is edification. How do we get edified? That is by the effectual working of the Word, right? That's the doctrine. That's where the strength comes from. That's where all the other inner man things that we need come from. And so, as we, as we just to kind of outline this process, as we um, understand and believe, that word does its work in us, it produces an edification. In other words, and that, that is a conforming us to the image of God's Son. That's what this whole process is about. So just to kind of say this together, the goal of justification is to provide for our eternal life. And, 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 and by the way, if you're not justified, you can't be sanctified. So justification is the basis. It is the foundation for everything else God wants to do. The goal of your sanctification is to be conformed to the image of God's Son. And now we've written on the board the process by which that gets done. And that means that what has to happen is we, we hear God's word or we read it or, or whatever. And then that goes to our minds. And then that goes to our heart. And then finally it goes to our feet. Do you understand when I say it that way? You start living out of it. And, and you know, we, the, uh, Paul uses this analogy about walking after the Spirit. That's when it would be in your feet, so to speak. Okay, I enjoyed that. You not so much. Okay. So the good that can be worked in us by all those sufferings and things like that is our being conformed to the image of God's Son. Knowing that, knowing that these are the opportunities to, to have Jesus Christ's life being lived in us means that we're going to suffer them differently. Because a, God, a, a person that... Do, let's suppose here's a person that doesn't know anything about what we're talking about. It doesn't matter if they're saved or lost. They don't know anything about this. When they go through sufferings, some people think, God is punishing me for something I did. That's what some folks think. And so what is that... You know, so that has, that has them viewing these sufferings as a chastisement. There are other folks that are thinking that, um, you know, they're, they're suffering and they expect God to fix it. So they're looking at these sufferings in that way. For a lost person, they just may be looking at sufferings as, you know, it's just something I need to get rid of. For a son, I'm not saying you shouldn't look to get rid of it. But for a son, you're going to go beyond that. While, however long you're in it, it is an opportunity to be conformed to the image of God's Son. And that makes a difference on how we go through the sufferings. So we're gaining some things. In your notes, I said, you know, we're gaining patience and long-suffering and forbearance and endurance those kinds of things. We're gaining a conformity to the image of God's Son. We're gaining the ability to deal with adversity in a godly fashion. So we don't go around constantly griping about our circumstances. Um, and again, doesn't mean we can't try to change them. Of course we do. Um, Paul looked at them this way. For our light affliction which is but for a moment. I know when Clifford and Barbara were saying, it's a short, you know, it's temporary. It, it really is. It may even be just a matter of a little while during the course of our life, but even if it's our whole life, Paul says, 
our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And so the sufferings that come to everyone, that's the sufferings of this present time, and the sufferings that come to sons in particular, and that's the sufferings of Christ, all of those sufferings involve a kind of praying so that we can make smart decisions out of that. So that's why, for example, for example, um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He didn't say for everything. He said in everything. I mean, you may not be glad that you fell and broke your arm. I just can't leave that alone. But you can be... You can be glad for an opportunity for something in the midst of that. That the character of Jesus Christ can be formed in you. And by the way, folks, I'm saying this, but if you said this in most churches, folks just wouldn't get this. That is the more important thing. This being conformed is the more important thing. And we really have to start looking at it that way. Um, okay. So... <clears throat> Now, this has taken us to the place where we can start to fill in the details, especially what we were talking about in the first session. Now, with this general, all I was doing in that first session is really giving you a general outlay for suffering and, and, and laying a context for this. Now, we're going to talk about praying for others. Praying for others is going to fall into two particular categories because they're either going to have a spiritual need or a physical need. And just because, uh, I, I, no, in line with what we have said before, that we have to quit thinking that prayer is asking God to go do something. When it comes to praying for others, we have to remember that. So in the middle of the paragraph, I gave you a sentence, and I should have put it at the first of the paragraph, and I probably should have put it in bold letters, and I probably should have underlined it. But I want you to, I want you to see that... It, that it is not about getting God to go do something for someone else. If Davy has a need, I, I, I'm not asking God to go take care of that. The, the, the line I should have emphasized is, praying for others is about moving us to action. That is the important thing. And if you're looking at that, you might want to underline it. Prayer is about getting ourselves focused and then laboring with our Father in light of that focus. Does everybody see that? Okay, do you see that major heading that says praying for others? What page is that on? Four. Four. The next paragraph starts as we think. The next paragraph is but just as. Look at the middle, from the middle of that paragraph where it says prayer is about moving us to action. Do you see that? That's the line you probably should underline. And the next line is prayer is how we get ourselves focused and then decide how we're going to labor in light of that focus. That's the kind of prayer that Paul was talking to the Philippians about in chapter 1, verse 9 of that book. You ever notice that Paul prays a lot for the saints that are in all these churches that he writes to? He does. But is he just informing God about what he would like to see happen? See, no. No. That's not what he's doing. When uh, Paul is doing that, in fact, he's not only... S There's two things going on here. He is praying for the people in these churches... But then he turns around and he tells them, not just, I've been praying for you, but he tells them exactly what he has been praying for them. Both of those, both of those are important and they have purpose. So, because since prayer is not about informing God of things he doesn't know about, 
What we're really doing here when we're praying for others is two things. Here's the first one. When we're praying to God for someone else, that prayer is really about what we're going to do in light of their situation. I'm pausing so that can sink in. And now you have forgotten it, so I will repeat it. Praying for others is where we make sonship decisions about what we are going to do. It's not, we have it backwards. Here's the way normal prayer works. Now, dear God, you know, uh, watch over Clifford while he's up there flying that airplane. And, and, and dear Lord, please uh, help Milt, you know, uh, with getting uh, all that, you know, got that heart valve issue. And we, we, we want you to bless him and help him with that. And these are real things, right? And, 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 and uh, uh, dear Lord, you know, uh, help... Help Clinton and what, I don't know what you got going, but you know, I could make stuff up. Uh, look, it, we're giving God a laundry list of stuff to do. And when we get through, if Milton says to me, well, you know what? It looks like I'm getting closer to the time where I'm going to have to have this heart surgery. And I go, well, been praying for you. That makes, well, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm saying it kind of flippantly, and I don't, I don't really, it's not always meant to be that way. Most of the time when we're praying about something that over which we have no control, we're just saying, I've been thinking about you, and I'm concerned, and I care about you. But that really doesn't do anything except let him know I'm his friend, and I care about him. There may be some small measure of comfort in that. I mean, that would certainly be better that if you said that to someone and they went, who cares? I mean, that might be detrimental. But, of course, that's some comfort. But is that all the comfort that God means for us to get out of this? No, because even the lost world does that kind of thing. They may not be praying about it, or, but, but they're thinking about someone and they feel bad about their situation. There's a greater thing, a greater comfort than that waiting in the Scripture. And so, I'm just saying, I want us to be unhappy with that little minimum being what we are supposed to do. Kind of lost track here, so I need to look because I got off on that. Uh, when, we're t when, when, when we're talking to God, look, I, I'm going to tell a story about you. Is it okay? Sure. You want to know which one? Oh. <laughs> if I tell you, they'll know already. So, is it okay for me to tell a story? All right, so m m it'll be a true one. Okay, you're worried about that one, right? Okay, look, um, I think everybody here knows that uh, Milt has, is going to need a heart valve replacement. He um, was, seemed to be a long ways from it, and sometime last year, all of a sudden, the numbers on that dropped considerably, and then it became a much more urgent thing. And I, um, I wish he didn't have to have it. So I could sit home and go, dear God, please don't, please, please don't let Milton have to have that. Just reverse his heart valve problem. We know that's not how that works. But I am thinking about him. I could call him up and go, gosh, I just feel terrible that that's happening to you, Milt. And that might help him to know that I'm his friend, but it really doesn't do anything beyond that. So what I did was, you know, I, I prayed about it, and I thought about it, and it was bothering me enough that, you know, Billy and I are talking about it, and she goes, and I said, you know, I just hate to do this because I don't want, I don't want him to feel like I'm trying to get in his business, and she goes, just tell him. Well, you know, talking to her, talking to the Lord pretty close to the same deal. You know, they both get to boss me. And um, so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to invite, she said, just invite them over after church. So we did. We invited them over after church one time, and I said, look, I just want to tell you something. It's not important what I said, but what is important is I formulated what I thought I could do. I, 
okay, if you have to know what it was, I, I attempted to, do, I said, I will do the surgery for free here at the, in the living room. <laughs> and he declined, but I did what I could. Actually, it wasn't that, but <laughs> he was going to decline anyway, I knew that. Uh, it was just, you know what, I just thought, you know, here's something. I just don't, now, I'm not saying that's, that's the greatest thing that could be done. I'm just saying this, that when you're praying for someone else, what you're doing is you're identifying their greatest need, and it may be more than one need, right? Can someone have a physical need and a spiritual need all at the same time? I think they really can. I think you ought to have a spiritual need that prepares you in the event the physical doesn't work out the way you want. And then you need to work on the physical so that if you can rectify it, then great. In the meantime, I'll take all the conforming to the image of God's Son I can get. So I'm just saying, it's when you're praying for others, here's what you're doing. You're talking to your Heavenly Father about what you're going to do. And so that takes me back to the point. The old way of praying is telling God what we would like to see Him do. And then we, to keep from being so bossy, we go, if it's your will, and then we just leave it alone. And if it doesn't get done, not our problem. We turned it over to Him. You know what that's like? That's like having a flat and saying, God, if you want the flat fixed, I'm going to need you to fix that. I got news for you. You might as well go ahead and sell that baby because he's not fixing it. Somebody is going to have to fix that. You say, oh, but how about if I pray this? Dear God, please influence someone so they will fix it. That's not working either. He's not doing that. He's not going around planting thoughts in people's head to manipulate in answer to our prayer. You know what is supposed to influence our thinking? The doctrine. And if the doctrine is working in us, we'll automatically be thinking about things the way our Father thinks about it. And then what? We'll be living out of that thinking. Right? You see that, right? So, I just want to make the point again, when we're praying for someone else, we're deciding what actions we are going to take. We're talking to our Father about what we, as best we can, perceive as their real need. And our prayers may contain information. Look, uh, when I'm thinking about the Milt's medical situation, when I'm talking to God, I would be, I, I said things like, you know, if he doesn't get better, he's going to have to have this procedure. I don't really want him to have this procedure. I'm not telling God anything he doesn't know. He knows about that condition. But I'm not telling God to inform him. You know what's happening to me right there? I'm trying to get my own thoughts organized. So I'm just talking to God like I would be talking to anybody else. I'm having a conversation and working out in my own mind what is going on with this. It is okay to talk with God about it that way as long as that's not the sum total of what we're doing. So, I want, so the next major phrase in your notes says this. Prayer brings responsibility. I'm going to say it this way. Nobody that listens to it, out this group may, may or may not like it. Outside of this group, most people are not going to like it. I'm sure that this is going to be like throwing it in the air and hollering pull. But I'm going to say it anyway. Prayer brings responsibility because we're not asking God to go fix the situation. Our prayer necessitates our involvement. So I'm going to say it this way. If you are not willing to get involved, quit wasting your time in prayer.
Davy walks out the door and somebody, you know, kidnaps him. Don't let that bother you. They will bring him back, okay? They kidnap him. You know what? You, do you go, that's not really the illustration I wanted to use because it doesn't fit now. With I just saw Davy and thought I would do that to him. But look, I can say, oh, oh God, they're putting him in the car. Get him out. Or I can run over and grab a hold of him and pull him out. Which one you think is going to work better? I mean, it's just like the flat tire. Dear God, I need you to fix that. Or I can arrange to fix it. This is not rocket science. We, we make it all so spiritual that it just doesn't work anymore. It's not truly spiritual in that way. So what I'm trying to say is, when, when we're talking about prayer, if you're not willing to get involved, you're not really praying. Because that's not, what prayer is, that's not how it's designed to work. Everybody understand what I'm saying about that? I know a while ago I said, quit wasting your time in prayer. But it's not really prayer. Not the way it's meant to be. Prayer is meant to incite us to action. And, and, and it works just that way. So if I... Remember I gave you the illustration of the folks in Indonesia in 2004, a quarter million people wiped out in those tsunamis, 14 different countries. If all I'm doing is sitting over here going, oh dear God, please bless those people over there that suffered those tsunamis, that did absolutely nothing. I want to be clear. God did not magically move on someone else's mind to go do something. He didn't do that. He didn't overpower anybody's will to make them help. And he didn't drop medical supplies out of the sky so that they landed on the ground fully available to everybody. That's not the way that worked. People got involved to do that. Those are Not all those people are saved, and some of them are. You say, well, what's the difference then between the charitable act of that and what you're asking us to do? I'm asking us to do what we're doing not because I happen to feel sorry or I happen to feel charitable. I'm asking us to do what we do because that doctrine has produced godly love and charity in us so that we respond to all the situations in our life just like our Heavenly Father would. Not arbitrarily. I happen to know this person, so now I'm invested. Or I happen to feel sorry for this situation, so now I'm going to do something. Godly love and charity is not based on the human whim of I think I am, I think I'm not. See, when God looks at this assembly, is there anybody he looks at and says, I really like them, but this other one not so much. It does it doesn't work that way. We don't need the, the human biases that say, when we do what we do, and I'm not saying you can do everything. Listen, you can't do everything. Whether or not you get involved in something is... Somebody want to fill in the rest of the sentence for that? Thank you. It's a sonship decision that you make by talking to your Heavenly Father. There are things I can't get involved in. If I'm not going to get involved, I can't... Look, I'm going to give you an illustration in the notes, so let me just jump to it. I don't know where we are in the notes with that, but, but here it is. I had the illustration of, here's someone that's hungry. Let's put aside for a moment the reason that they're hungry, but let's just say our intention is to meet that need. Somebody want to tell me how you can do that? Buy them a sandwich. Buy them some food. Bring them some groceries. 
But when you do that, stop just for a moment and think about it this way. Here is an opportunity for Christ to live His life in me. And instead of me just being motivated out of some human charitable act, which is good, but listen, listen, it's good. It's not godly. Godliness comes from somewhere else. I know the people getting it. Look, it's a, it's a, I would rather the world be like that. It's not always like that. It is good, but it's not godly. We, as sons and daughters, have to be more than what the lost world can be. We have to be more than good. We have to be godly. Which means we are not being motivated by the external circumstances that we were before, but now the Word that is working in us is what compels us to do the things that we're doing. And in a rational, intelligent conversation with our Heavenly Father, we're making decisions about what we really are going to be involved in. That's got to be the motivation. It looks the same in what you do. You buy a guy a hamburger, another guy, he buys a guy a hamburger. If I do it out of godliness, that guy doesn't care. But God does. Do you know why? Because it puts on display something that makes an impact in the heavenly realm. You don't see it with your physical eyes, but that's the impact that's being made. So it is not enough to just be humanly kind and charitable, but now it is a godly love and charity. That is, it's our Heavenly Father's. And that's, that's what being a son is. That's the difference this is. So here's the, But let's suppose you don't have any money on you. Or let's suppose the circumstances are different. It's not a guy that's sitting on the side of the road that doesn't have anything to eat. Listen, say it's like that. Suppose this is a, a condition for a group of people that's too big for you to solve. What can you do? Yeah, you can get other people to help. You, you may wind up not putting any of your own money into it, but you put your own time and effort to organize the thing. But again... What would be the motivation for that? Let the doctrine be the driving force to produce that. Is it okay to see a need and talk to your Heavenly Father about your involvement in that need? I, I, I don't only think that's okay. I think that's the way it's supposed to work. Father, do I want to get involved in this? And, and, and I say it that way. I don't mean it to me like, do I think this is worthy? I mean, you know what? I'm just saying, is this something I should be involved in? And you make a decision about that. So, I'm not, again, not looking at the notes here, but... So, if that, if that... It's something you either go, you go do it yourself, or you organize it, and, and you help get it done. But the point is... If you're not willing to get involved on some level, stop thinking that all you need to do is tell God about the situation and then leave it with Him if it's His will. Because that's how we love to pray because it relieves us from any responsibility after that. What I'm telling you is that real prayer for others puts the responsibility squarely on us. So now, let's, let me use me for an example, because I don't want to put anybody on the spot in this one. Let's suppose that I'm going through a, 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 a persecution or some kind of affliction. And let's suppose I'm diagnosed with some, you know, terrible disease. And you think about that and you think, you know what, I do like Mike after all, and I do want to help him. What, you know, what can I do? It's not a physical thing. I mean, I mean, let's suppose you can't fix the physical thing. What can you do that will help me? I hope this silence is not because you have no interest in helping me. 
okay. Okay, all right, all right. And physical things, you could do some things I couldn't do anymore. But in the spiritual area, what can you do? Okay, you, would, you, you could encourage me. And one way to encourage me would be... Thank you. To remind me of the doctrine. Remind me of the doctrine. And encourage me to engage in the doctrine. Don't let my circumstances overwhelm me. But let the doctrine, you know, ground me so that I don't feel the effects of that. You see what I'm saying? Can, can we get involved in the spiritual aspect? See, I think we should. That leads me to this point. See, when you see this, you're going to go, gee, Mike is a real genius, because look, he just sewed all that right together. Okay, I know you wouldn't have come to that decision on your own. That's why I told it to you. So here it is. That is why Paul is telling them what he has been praying for them for. He is reminding them in the midst of their adversities what they need to be focusing on and thinking about and depending on. Does that make sense? That's the reason for telling them. See, Paul's not just going, hey, I've been praying for y'all. As though, I'm just letting you know I care about you and there it is. No, he is refocusing them on the very things that they need to get their mind on. These, remember when I, I know you thought that was just a long rabbit trail, but remember a Sunday ago when I did all those different books and we ran through them and I said, this was phase one of the policy of evil. This was phase two of the policy of evil. This was phase three of the policy of evil. Here's the advanced tactics of phase one. The adva and we went through all that. Paul knows where they are. He knows what's happening. And he's saying this. These are the things you need to be focused on. Part of those things he's been praying for and telling. And so can he really pray? Not for them to get it. But he can pray for them to be strengthened with might by God's Spirit in their inner man because of the doctrine that they understand. So when he's talking to God about, you know, I'm praying they will be, you know what he's saying? I'm expecting them to lay hold on this truth that they know and trust it. Right? That's what, So when he says, you know, I, I pray God may give unto you you know, the spirit of understanding. He's not talking about just, just give you something just out of the blue and you had no idea it was coming, now all of a sudden you know it. He's talking about, he's talking about what he wants. Them. He's, talking to, he's saying to God, here's what I wish they would do. And when he talks to them, he tells them exactly what he was telling God about so that they'll be reminded of the doctrine. But there's a second issue there. And that is... Sometimes he's talking to them about something they don't already know. And when he does that, do you know what follows? The yeah, the instruction in that doctrine. Okay, so... Okay, and Clifford is saying, if they're not sons and daughters, that, that doesn't do any good to do that. And that's true. That's the last thing we're going to talk about. What do I got left here? Oh, good. Well, that's not going to happen. Uh, but look, we do need to cover that. What, and we will. It would be the very last part of this in praying for others. How do, you, how do you pray for people that don't have any idea about the doctrine working in them? So, say that again. Okay, you have to discern where they're at, and then you have to try it. Look, if you're going to get them any help at all, you're going to have to explain something to them. What happens if you don't feel like you can explain it? Huh? It doesn't get done. Well, you do, you do have a couple of choices. What else can you do? 
give them my phone number. That's sort of what I was talking about without the phone number part. I was thinking, you know what? Get someone else that does know something about how to explain that and, and bring them with you. And then just sit down and say, look, I know you're going through a terrible time. There is real comfort sitting in the Word of God. And if you'll believe that and trust that, it can produce a comfort in the midst of great adversity. I want you to know about it, but I brought someone along that I think can explain it better than I can. So let them explain it. And if you have any questions, we'll try to answer your questions. What else can you do? Yeah, if you've got a, one of the videos at home that explains that, take that to them. What else can you do? Look up that part in your notes and copy it. Here's a really good way to do it. Let me show you this. Why don't you read over it? And when I've given you a few days to read it, let me come back and let's have a talk about it. Does that, is it possible for someone to hear that and go, I'm not interested? Of course. They may watch the video and go, no, I'm asking God to heal me. I'm not, I'm not doing that stuff. In fact, I used to joke about that. But anyway, you know, they may reject that. In, in that case, the best you can offer them is to say, I care about you. And I want to be here for you. And just let them know that, that, you, that you care about them and, and you're sorry for their situation. That's as good as it's going to get with them. But it is possible to take folks further if they will go. Right? So if they don't know, Clifford was right. You know, it's funny that he got there mentally with all this that we're talking about. And he did that. And you may have been thinking the same thing. If, if they don't know about this, you can't do what Paul... But who is Paul writing to? Every prayer that Paul records the details of is written to saints who have been under his instruction. So yeah, he's teaching them and he's reminding them. But before he did that, don't you know that he was praying with his heavenly father about how can I get involved? The Philippians, huh? That's exactly right. That, look, he's talking to his father and he said, I know what you guys are going through. He always talked to God and said, what do these people need? Remember, identify that need and then how am I going to get involved? So you know what he does? He writes a letter. And for some of them he says, I plan to come and see you shortly. And for some he does not. Which ones does he... Which, how does God... How does Paul make the decision about who to go visit and who not? Well, I really like the Philippians, but those Ephesians, eh. Their hotels aren't very good. I don't like it there. What is he, how is he doing that? Okay. I don't, okay. Whether he's in jail or not. Okay. Look, I, I, I should have asked the question maybe a little differently. In other words, what's the process he goes through in order to make that decision? He's talking with his heavenly father, right, and making a sonship decision. So, yeah, some, and some, some he does go see and some he doesn't. Some he writes to twice. He writes to the Corinthians the first time to get them back on track. And then you know what he does? See, I should have put all these things in the notes. It would have been great. But you know what he does? He says, I'm going to send Timothy to check on you. And so I can get a report on how you're doing. Why? Paul, see, when Paul's praying for others, he's thinking, how can I get involved? And if he says, I can't go, you know what he does? He sends somebody. See, he's involved. I know business people look at that and say, Paul was a delegator. But look, I'm just saying. Paul was involved. Praying for others means I'm going to get involved. And you're going to have to talk to your Heavenly Father about how you're going to get involved. No more. No more. 
Dear God, Clifford's in real trouble. I just pray you'll help him. And now I'm done. No, if he's in trouble, if I'm talking to my Heavenly Father about it, sometimes I almost wish God would do this. That someone would say, Okay, I'm Gloria, you want to do a role play here for a minute? Okay. I want you to repeat this phrase, okay? I want you to say, Lord, Clifford's in real trouble, and I want you to help him. I wish God would do it this way. I'm going to play the part of what God would do. You ready? Okay. Lord, Clifford's in real trouble. Oh, just stop. I just wish God would do that. Just stop. What are you thinking about doing? I wish he would do that. Because then when we get clued in, do you see? See, as soon as I would say, Dear Lord, I need you, I wish you would just go, Stop! You don't tell me what to do. My word should be working in you to tell you what to do. Amen. Right? I mean, after all, we serve Him. When God came to me and saved me, He said, This is why I'm saving you, because I need someone to schedule out my stuff and tell me what I'm doing. Because that's the role all of us seem to think we have. Instead, our role is for this word, his wisdom, to be installed in our inner man so that he can tell us what to do and when to do it. Do you see how that got reversed? But it's been done so subtly and it's so entrenched that really... We just wake up every morning with a whole list of stuff for God to get busy doing. <laughs> now look, you, and you do realize, and we didn't cover it. I guess I'll take the first session next week and just finish it. But, but look, when, when we're doing it, you do realize if it's Christ in you, that is God doing that. That's why I said we have to be more than just human charitable dispensers. It has to be Christ in us. Because when it is, now God is doing it. Not just us. That's the, that's the difference nobody can see in what gets done except the angels. Because that is put on display. So when we're praying for others, so we've, we've covered most of this. We'll finish this up when we come back because I don't want to leave any part out. There's just some other verses to look at here. But when we're praying for others, think of it, start thinking of it this way. Father, Clifford's in real trouble. I need to talk to you about what I'm going to do. And why would you need to talk to him about it? Because prayer activates the doctrine. P prayer is what brings the things that you know into your mind. It helps you, because in the beginning, you may be thinking one thing, but at the end, you might be thinking something else. You won't just be looking at the physical circumstance, but you might also be now looking at the spiritual circumstance. Remember when Audie had his wreck? And when I went up to the hospital and Bud was in the room with him, and when I walked in, here was the first thing I said. And I didn't understand as much about it back then as I do now, but I said, man, here's a real opportunity to build your joint heir inheritance. And Bud looked at me and said, we were just talking about that. Now, I'll never forget that because I thought this is one of the few times I've ever walked into a hospital room and could have said that. And, and the people in the room would have went, yeah, we were just talking about that. But you, you understand, I just wanted to put the whole focus over on there's something supposed to be working in us, even in these times, right? Okay, all right, so we'll stop here. We'll finish off this last bit of this when we come back next time. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll be done for today. Heavenly Father, we love you and we're thankful um, that in all these different kinds of prayer, you are affecting all the different aspects of our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we get the privilege of being engaged 
of being your hands and feet in this world. And that is going to be important that the doctrine is working in us so that you are able to tell us what to do and, and to make decisions and how to do it. Uh, thank you, Lord, for... I'm just thinking about all these things. I'm really grateful for all of that. Amen. Hey, don't shut that tape off yet. If you haven't already. If you have, it's okay. Look, you remember we're, in, we're, gonna, we're fixed to go back to Romans 12 and get into these four decision-making skills. Wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. Remember we talked about justice being the norms of standards of what God considers to be right and wrong or good and evil. But, okay. But what was judgment? It was the ability to make decisions between several choices when none of them are wrong. Do you see now, with what we're just talking about in prayer, how godly judgment will come into play when you are deciding what it is you will be involved in and what you will not? It's the ability to make choices between several good things. And while I have told you that even, look, even if you, you that, that there's not a wrong choice there, even if you chose a wrong choice, God isn't mad at you, but, e but, but among choices that are out there, even if you choose one that's okay, we need to learn how to choose what really the one our Father would choose. Or I say the one, but I mean choose the ones our Father would choose. And here's the more important thing. To choose those for the same reasons He would. If that thinking isn't in us, then we're just, we just happen to get lucky and choose the one He chose, but for a whole different reason. You see what I'm saying? So what we're talking about here is dovetailing right into what we're about to learn in Romans 12. That we're going to make godly, judgmental decisions, which means it's not about what's right and wrong. Now it's about picking out of many options what our Heavenly Father would pick. Do you reckon we're always going to get that right? No. Is it, is it conceivable that at some point we might really have a choice of equals? I mean, I think so. I think so. It, maybe the more I understand about it later, I'll come back later and go, you know what, I don't guess there is such a thing. But for now, what I understand, you know what, you, the, you can have a couple of things that you can be engaged in if you can't be engaged in both, and your Heavenly Father would be perfectly happy with either one of those the one you get involved in may then come out of your abilities to deal with whatever that different situation is. I mean, I don't know. We'll talk about that. Okay, anyway, I wanted to say that here at the end because as I, right in the middle of that prayer, I was thinking, man, this is godly judgment. That's what this is. Talking to my Heavenly Father and making decisions about what I'm going to be involved in and how I'm going to help, and what, what that's going to entail. Can you see how that's valuable? Yeah. Okay. We'll finish this up next week. So thank you for your patience.